Hey everyone, Steve the Amateur Historian here. In a part of Portland that I haven't frequented that much. I'm in the St. John's neighborhood, North Portland. And this is a, uh, a pretty big video. This is a pretty big deal. This is, uh, I'd have to say, unless I'm missing something, the most tragic criminal act that has happened in the history of this neighborhood, at least in terms of the lore of this neighborhood. Thelma Taylor was born in 1933. She was 15 years old in 1949. She had just finished her freshman year of high school and she had a summer job way off in Hillsboro, 15, 20 miles that way. And she would get up, you know, just shows the work ethic of some people. She would get up at four in the morning to catch a bus to go all the way to Hillsboro to do, I think she was like a bean, green bean picker. She, she was like involved in bean harvesting as a summer job with some of the other kids in this area. And one morning in particular, she left her home early. You know, it's the 1940s. We still believed we could let our kids go outside without supervision and nothing bad would happen to him. This guy, this 22 year old guy, pulls up in his car. What he's doing, driving around St. John's at four in the morning, just joyriding, you know. Thelma can't know, but he offers her a ride. And it's the 1940s and she says yes. She gets into his car and next thing you know, she doesn't show up for her job. She's missing nobody knows where she is her family's obviously becoming concerned and suddenly we have a real serious problem with this 15 year old girl who's gone missing from the st john's neighborhood but before we dive too head on into the tragic story that is the focus of this video i want to take you to a few locations that were prominent in Thelma Taylor's very short life. So the school behind me, located on North Charleston Avenue, I believe. It's going north and south, that's usually Avenue. That's a, the James John School. That is a school where Thelma Taylor went for her uh, elementary school years. Um, and we're really, really close to her murder site. We're maybe like six blocks away. You know, it's a small community. And from where Thelma Taylor had her earliest years of education, I'm heading to the, well, northeast of that school, but also kind of the northeast fringe of St. John's in general to the site of her middle school and I gotta say St. John's is just just a potpourri of humanity there's like you'll be walking for five blocks and it's kind of bougie and then a couple blocks later I was just at a stop back there there was one guy standing at a bus stop staring at me like he was gonna knife me there's a lot of red there was like like a guy had like an ATV parked in his front yard like it was a lawn ornament with a big American flag there just weird stuff and then just a really sketchy homeless guy just meandering in a parking lot very very interesting and on that note i've come to the site of thelma taylor's uh next place of education this here i've only been able to find information regarding it as the george school george middle school i don't know who this George is, if that's a last name or a first name, 
But anyway, this is where Delma Taylor went to school after going to the James John School. And I'm making my pass through here rather quick. I'm noticing there's a lot of parents parked along the street, so I'm guessing school, or at least some classes are getting out soon. So I have a lot of parents staring at the guy with the camera videoing their kid's middle school. <laughs> Don't want to be giving anybody the wrong impression, but yeah, even on the sign back here, it just says George Middle School. But anyway, it was from here that Thelma Taylor ultimately found her way to her high school years. And again, small community, the first school that Thelma Taylor attended, James John School, was located on Charleston, one block off Central, which is this road right here, and we're traveling sort of southeast because the place where she went to high school happens to have an address that is on Central Avenue. <laughs> This here is Roosevelt High School, the main high school attended by the uh, young teens that are residents primarily of the St. John's area. Beautiful old high school. All these old iconic Portland high schools look like this. And like a lot of major American cities, primarily all the high schools in the Portland, actual city limits of Portland are named after famous people. Franklin, Wilson, Lincoln, Grant, Cleveland, uh, even Jefferson. And it's interesting, you know, we still have a high school named after Thomas Jefferson in this city. We had high schools named after George Washington and John Adams, the two presidents that preceded Jefferson. Um, John Adams High School was used as the exteriors for the 2003 Gus Van Zandt film Elephant and then was demoed about a decade ago and the George Washington High School has also been closed for many decades and uh, today is being used as offices for Whole Foods but for our purposes this is the high school that Thelma Taylor was a student at where she completed her freshman year of high school back in 1949 and unfortunately she never made it to her sophomore year. Walking on Columbia Boulevard which is very loud and my video is actually going to conclude along this boulevard so here somewhere else and then back here from the locations where Thelma Taylor attended school uh, throughout her very short life. I'm now going to take you to the location where she lived and grew up in this St. John's area. So I'm on Mears Street. Um, Thelma Taylor's uh, childhood home, which is still standing, it was built in the 1920s. So it was pretty young when she was born there. Her parents may have even been the first owners of the house. But anyway, she lived at the northwest corner of Oregonian Avenue and Mears. Technically having an Oregonian Avenue address. And I believe this is it right here, just past this fence. We're gonna pass by it pretty close. Kind of a quaint, quaint little, little setup. Kind of cute. Yeah, definitely seen, seen better days.
it's only about three to four blocks from her front door where Thelma Taylor would have stopped right here. This is the intersection of, I'm probably gonna butcher this name, uh, Fessenden or Fessenden, I really don't know how it's pronounced. I'm not super familiar with this area, but Fessenden, as I've always called it, is this crossing street. And then this street going across like this is Midway. Now, it's unknown exactly for certain, give or take, a distance like the route I took to get here may have not been the way that she went in fact she may have gone the opposite instead of coming up to Fessenden, Fessenden and coming this way she may have gone down Mears and to Midway and come down here that would have been a more likely route that she would have gone but nobody knows for sure the fact of the matter is it's unknown for certain how close to the vicinity of this bus stop she was when Leland pulled up and offered to give her a ride. Um, odds are he would have been driving along this stretch since Midway is kind of a side street. He probably would have been going up and down this road here. Um, and either Thelma was here waiting for her bus as she would on it, or it wasn't a bus, but I think she was actually getting picked up by a vehicle that, you know, kind of carpooled. Uh, people out there, but she was at this location, or she would be. Um, so she could have been walking this stretch right here, and Leland pulled up along this stretch. And it's unknown for certain, but the last time Thelma Taylor was free before her death, she would have been literally right in this pretty much spot where I'm standing right now. According to official record, Thelma Taylor left her St. John's home at 4.15 a.m. in the early morning hours of Friday, August 5th, 1949, to meet with her friend to catch a ride several miles west to Hillsboro for her summer job as a bean picker. Hours later, Thelma's friend, Janet, would contact her parents to tell them that Thelma never showed up for their ride west. Instead, likely sometime between 4.15 and 4.30 in the morning, 15-year-old Thelma was approached by 22-year-old petty criminal Morris Leland in a stolen car, who offered to give her a ride. She accepted. The two traveled west towards the St. John's Bridge when Leland turned off onto a side street, leading down below the bridge to an area full of overgrown shrubbery and forgotten lands. According to Leland himself, they followed along the railroad lines down there and stopped several blocks north of the bridge, where he took Thelma down by the river in an area totally concealed from the rest of the world. Rumors have, unjustly, stated that Leland kept Thelma down by the river for several days. Untrue. That he raped her, perhaps multiple times. There is no evidence of this. It's also been misreported by many that Thelma was held in the vicinity of what is now Cathedral Park, directly below the St. John's Bridge, when she was actually kept several blocks north of the park's current site. Leland's intent must have been to sexually assault the young girl, as he had a lengthy record of assault in his past. He had only recently been released from the Rocky Butte Jail. However, instead of making quick work of the young woman, the two would spend more than 27 hours together down by the river. This isn't to say that Leland didn't make the effort. Reports say that at one point he became so frustrated by his unwillingness to assault the girl that he began hitting her, knocking her out for several hours. She wouldn't wake until nightfall, still unmolested. The two would spend the night at this spot. It's unknown what Leland may have done to confine Thelma as he slept. Obviously, he couldn't assume that she wouldn't run away. By sunrise the following morning, more than a day together, the two heard the sounds of railroad workers working to connect some cars a short distance away. Thelma heard people close by and screamed for help. 
Acting to stop Thelma from attracting attention, Leland pulled up a large metal rod he had found the day before and struck the teenager, repeatedly hitting her in the head. He also took out a knife that he had concealed with him and stabbed her twice, once in the chest and once in the side. The stab to the chest pierced the young girl's heart. And so the life of young Thelma Taylor ended. But the story is hardly a common example in regards to a crazed criminal taking the life of an innocent victim of chance. As opposed to the usual story we're used to hearing of a victim being abducted, potentially raped, and murdered within hours and sometimes not being found for months or even years, Thelma managed to keep herself alive for more than a day and, despite unsubstantiated claims that Leland did, in fact, sexually assault her, Thelma's autopsy report showed that she had not been molested in such a way. After finally carrying out the killing, Leland remained there, down by the river, smoking like a chimney before passively obscuring Thelma's body under some driftwood. He cleared up his cigarette butts, wiped his prints from the lunch pail Thelma had carried, and generally cleaned up the crime scene before fleeing. Even with Thelma being reported as a missing person, it seems little to no focus was put down at the base of the St. John's Bridge, as no search efforts reportedly occurred there. Furthermore, according to Leland's own story, Thelma screamed or called out for help multiple times, only to have nobody come or report that they heard screaming down by the river. So I'm walking out onto the St. John's Bridge right now. Uh, Lore would have you believe that Thelma Taylor was murdered right, pretty much right underneath this bridge. That's kind of the story that has prevailed over time. Uh, mostly because, you know, the St. John's Bridge is the most iconic landmark in town. Uh, so, you know, people would tend to want to let, uh, gravitate stories in that direction. However, the fact of the matter is the approximate discovery, the murder site of Thelma Taylor was roughly eight blocks north of the St. John's Bridge in this direction. And I'm going to try to capture for you a few different angles, getting as close as I can to where the murder site was because it's all uh, either inaccessible property or it's private property now. There's a big Toyota building uh, along the river and that lines up almost perfectly with where Thelma Taylor's body was discovered. As it always is, Cathedral Park, located below the bridge, always a little bit flooded until summertime, sometimes even in summertime. This area right along here is where uh, there were misreports that have kind of permeated over time that Thelma Taylor died right in the vicinity of the bridge in the Cathedral Park area. Still down by the river, but somewhere in this area. And pan and pan and here's that big Toyota building I was talking about well it's more wide than big um, if you line up that building with the river that right in the middle you can see there's kind of an old dock out there right in the vicinity of that dock kind of in between that and this building is where Thelma Taylor's body was actually discovered so you can see a little bit of a distance from the actual bridge itself where I'm standing right now.
right, so about a block or two down from the St. John's Bridge, which is over this way, I'm going down Baltimore Avenue, and I'm going to try to get as close to ground level views of the general vicinity of where Thelma Taylor was. Obviously, I can't get anywhere near the spot because it's all fenced off, and most of it's probably owned by this large Toyota conglomerate that's down here. But I am going to do the best I can to bring you uh, angles from all directions and from ground level where the events were actually happening. Through here, uh, we're actually down under the bridge, which means Leland would have had to turn his vehicle off of Philadelphia Avenue, which is the road that crosses the St. John's Bridge, before getting, you know, even up to it because he would have had to get down here. He would have had to turn on Syracuse and then potentially he drove down Baltimore here. I'm not sure how developed these streets were back in 1949. Here's the railroad lines. And this is the entrance to Cathedral Park at the base of the bridge. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk down Bradford Street here as far as I can. This is mostly industrial. So logistically, as the story goes, Leland uh, brought Thelma Taylor down along the railroad tracks with references in his story to traveling down the railroad tracks before ultimately going down by the river and that makes sense because these tracks go right through here and her killing site if I could use my finger roughly over in this direction From the industrial confines of Bradford Street, kind of straddling that and the park over here, I'm going to go the next street up. It's roughly a block and a half, two blocks up. I think it's called Decatur Street. It's a little bit further back from this mess, and it might give us a little bit more of a view of the general area. So, off Philadelphia down Syracuse, turn down Baltimore a few blocks, so the railroad tracks right here, and down Bradford Street is the most likely route that Leland would have taken when the two of them were together. Uh, from what I've heard, I heard this from one source, that a lot of the uh, documents, uh, the legal documents in regards to the case, have disappeared or were destroyed. So, we know the story because Leland confessed to it uh, in detail and took the authorities right to the body. We know that he was the killer. Uh, but there's lots of other little details that are just kind of up for speculation. We'll never know. Walking down Decatur Street, if you can even really call it a street. It almost looks like a gravelly driveway to someone's criminal lair. But it makes sense, there's not a lot going on in this particular area. The homes are up there, it's all industrial over here. It's not really a lot of a need to develop this particular road. Never been down this way. These streets that I'm checking to try to get as close as I can to the murder site. Never been down them before, so this is all just uh, a lot of guesstimation trying to find 
any spot where I can gauge a view of the site. And to further dismiss the speculation that it happened near the St. John's Bridge back over there. It's back down to the construction zone. See how much further I can go. There's all those cars in the front of the wall. Alright, I'm coming to the end of the road. This is not St. Louis. This is a concealed street name. What is the freaking name of this street? Uh, Catlin. There's another business over here. And it looks like to the other side of this business is probably where that large Toyota building is. I don't, I don't know where this goes. Now it's really getting obscure up here. I might be able to gauge a view from here though. Yeah, because this just goes into somebody's front yard. Yeah. Through the trees here, that white, beige building. That's that big long Toyota building. So just past it, probably right there, you know, along the river, is where Thelma Taylor's body was discovered and also was the site of the murder itself. On August 11th, almost a week after Thelma went missing, Morris Leland was pulled over at the intersection of North Michigan and Failing, just east of St. John's, approximately six miles from where he had killed Thelma Taylor. He was arrested for stealing another vehicle, and almost immediately he asked to speak to a homicide officer. He openly confessed to murdering the missing teenager, writing out and signing a confession that same day. He then led authorities down by the river where he had hidden Thelma's body, leading to her uncovering. Leland's openness, knowledge of Thelma's whereabouts, and the fact that his story corroborated with details of the case made it clear that he was the actual killer. In October of the following year, 1950, Leland went on trial for the murder, pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. The jury believed none of it, and by February 1951, he was found guilty of the murder with a sentence of death in the gas chamber handed down that April. Morris Leland would ultimately meet his maker on January 9th, 1953, when he was executed in said gas chamber. Decades later, the scrub brush that fortified the area along the river near the St. John's Bridge was developed into Cathedral Park. More significantly, since Thelma Taylor's death, there have been endless reports by locals and visitors alike of paranormal encounters there, hearing Thelma's spirit screaming or calling for help in the vicinity of that park. These claims have created a great deal of spiritual attraction to the area amidst the assurance that Thelma Taylor's spirit, without a doubt, haunts the area. This has been countered by others, who express that all the industrial businesses that have opened in the area, as well as oddities, strange sounds coming from the St. John's Bridge itself, have created the potential for odd noises to occur in the area, sounds possible to confuse as the screams of a spirit. The fact that Thelma was killed several blocks from the site of Cathedral Park also cast doubts on claims that she haunts that park space since she didn't actually die there. However, a few blocks isn't much. 
I personally don't find this to be enough on its own to dismiss the validity of these claims of hauntings. It's hard to say exactly how many of these reports are accurate. Furthermore, one blogger, deathinspadesandmore.com, discusses, for example, that many Chinese immigrants were used to construct the railroad lines that still run through St. John's today, back in the early 1900s. They were overworked and many died as a result of their working conditions, often simply buried along the railroad lines they were currently constructing. Thus, if any place along the river is being haunted, these fallen laboring immigrants might possibly be the result, among others, just as well as Thelma Taylor. Whatever the case, the lore of the horrid death of Thelma Taylor and the stories of her still lingering near her death site, still calling for help, don't seem to be disappearing anytime soon. It's a very interesting story of conscience. You have this guy who had a criminal record going back to, you know, before he was a teen. He'd had multiple rape convictions or, and accusations as well. Um, so this is a guy that didn't really seem to have much compassion, empathy for anyone. And yet, he abducts this 15-year-old girl with a total objective to assault her like he's done in the past. And instead, he's just with her for more than a day. And despite lore, again, there's no evidence that he sexually molested Thelma Taylor in any way. And by his account, his admittance, there was multiple times where he made a move and she would find a way to convince him to stop. And he would stop each time. It just boggles my mind that she could have such an effect like that on him. And then a few days later, when he gets pulled over and encountered by an officer of the law, he immediately admits to it. Like, killing her just drove him absolutely out of his mind, not so insane. You know, obviously, all I know about Thelma Taylor is the little bit of information you can get. She was 15, she lived in St. John's, she was a Roosevelt High School student, she was working a summer job. Um, I believe she was a churchgoer with her family. I mean, all you know is the general details, but just knowing that aspect and the, uh, the fact that this just piece of garbage human being that abducted a teenage girl off the street with the intent of assaulting her, the fact that she got so just into his mind, into his head, that even after her death, there was just this voice inside of him screaming to just admit it and accept the consequences and the penalties for the things he did and the fact that he did something so horrible to someone who clearly had to be just an amazing person, even at only 15 years of age. Like, it just makes me wonder what this Thelma Taylor was like. She had to just be so amazing and so wise beyond her years to have that profound of an effect on somebody who was just a throwaway human being. Like, that's just mesmerizing to think about. I literally have not been able to get it out of my head since I started thinking about it. It's just, it's wild and it's not something you really ever see when you're examining tragic cases such as this, a case of some derelict taking the life of someone so completely innocent. And here I am, right back where I left you guys off, right over there, again, is the place Thelma Taylor would have been waiting to get picked up when she got picked up by the wrong guy. I'm actively waiting at the bus stop going the other way so I can finish this story, this video properly.
boy did I get lucky. Thought I was gonna have to backtrack over there and then get off and zigzag this way. I realized the bus I was on was passing literally within two blocks of the place I would have been backtracking to catch a max line to get to. I'm in Kenton, the heart of the place. Kenton's a really great uh, example of a place that literally was turning into just a drug, booze-ridden hellhole, and they kind of revitalized it. But for my sake, I'm only just passing through here to get to another place that, like most of the spots I've been to in this video, is a place I've never been to before. Can't pass through Kenton without paying respects to the Paul Bunyan statue, which they recently fixed up, but I'm taking some back streets here to get to where I want to be. No. area and you think like what could anything in this area have to do with Thelma Taylor? So I'm here at the historic Columbian, not to be confused with Columbia Cemetery because there, there's a Columbia and a Columbian Cemetery. This is one of the oldest cemeteries in Portland. It says established 1857. This is where Thelma Taylor was buried by her family. And alas, you, people used to be able to come in here. I, you look on Google Maps, this gate's wide open. I've had friends who have come and said, oh yeah, we just went out to the cool old Columbian Cemetery that's apparently haunted, but, you know, people are probably coming out here, partying, vandalizing the place, you know, making it so you, you can't get into anything anymore because people have to ruin it for you. But um, as I learned from people who have actually been here, Thelma Taylor was buried kind of towards the back. I can see the tip of a gazebo back there. And they said that she was uh, just off to one side of that. So, and near the back. So kind of up over this ridge. So unfortunately, unlike some of these headstones, we there's no way we're gonna see her from here. Uh, but yeah, she was buried towards the back. Uh, near, they said near buildings and blackberry bushes. Um, I don't see any blackberry bushes towards either side here, so I'm guessing she's way back there. But yeah, this was her final resting place after her body was found. Last rites were given. She had a memorial at a funeral home over on Lombard. And then finally, the path of her short-lived life ended right here. So, from the site of Thelma Taylor's ending, I'm gonna bring this video to a close. Um, I hope you, I don't wanna say enjoyed it, but I hope it was a worthwhile experience for you. This is a, a crime that still continues to mesmerize people almost 70 years later. Um, and it's definitely one of the most memorable, impossible to forget uh, criminal stories in the history of the St. John's neighborhood, which is one of the more well-known neighborhoods in the whole, whole of Portland. So guys, till next time, as I venture under the overpass, this has been 
Steve, the amateur historian, and I will see you guys next time.